Welcome to The Writer's Dream. Our show is a show where writers could talk about how they write their books, how they publish their books, and how they market their books. My name is Linda Maria Frank. I'm the author of Annie Tillery Mysteries. And um, we are on Facebook. You can find The Writer's Dream on Facebook. Just search The Writer's Dream. Uh, if you have a question or you want to be on the show, you can message me through that Facebook page. We're also on YouTube. And on YouTube, uh, you have to uh, search my name, Linda Maria Frank, click on my picture, and my channel will come up. And uh, we have over 100 interviews with authors. And those of you who are interested in finding good books or finding out how authors uh, manage to get their books published and uh, in front of the public, you'll find some very good advice and some very interesting stories on uh, those DVDs that you will see, those videos that you'll see on YouTube. Today's guest is Vito Gentili. He is a return guest. Uh, he's a poet. And uh, we're happy to have you here, Vito. You're always Thank a you. delightful guest. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, my name is Vito Gentili, as you just heard. And um, I write. And I write because I can't stop writing. And uh, I have dyslexia, which makes it sort of difficult to just sit down and write something. You have to think about it and how to spell it and everything else like that. So I started to write when I was about five years old and with hieroglyphics because I couldn't spell. And uh, as time went on, I found people that would help me uh, translate my, 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 my <laughs> writing into English. And, uh, and that was very important. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to be writing because since I couldn't spell, uh, they thought I had in Catholic grade school that I was slow. So they left me in the back of the room. And in high school, they put me in a thing called remedial reading, which was basically a class for juvenile delinquents. Uh, so I had no basic education. And, uh, but somehow, you find that you can do things you never thought you could do. And uh, when I got my first job, which was down on Wall Street as a runner, they realized I could count. And not only could I count, I could remember what I counted. And things start morphing, and people say, you have ideas, put them down on paper. And by 22, I had written a book called The Fundamentals of Wall Street, and also taught uh, the subject down on Wall Street. And, uh, and then I started to write plays, and screenplays, and essays, and, and then my poetry. And, uh, and now I have 23 collections of poems, not all published, uh, just three of them are published, and, uh, and, and, and one of my plays is published, and one of my books called Little Christmas, about growing up at Christmas and getting bopped on the side of the head because I got into the gifts in the closet or something like that. And uh, so I'm very happy, and I'm living now out on Long Island, and I'm very content also. So it's, uh, it's been a wonderful life. So when is your writing better, when you're uh, not content or when you're content? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's when your life is in turmoil when, when your life is peaceful. When uh, It's very strange because if I'm out in the garden mowing, which is my favorite pastime, <laughs> when I lived in the city, like I lived in London and Manhattan, uh, I walked. But you can't walk out here because no. we don't have streets. You don't and have sidewalks. No, you don't have sidewalks. You have nothing. So Take your I life mow. In your hands. And when I'm mowing, if I'm writing, I start going faster because it's getting good. If it's going slow, because I'm trying to think what I'm doing. So yes, I do. I write like that. Um, my mind uh, constantly thinks of different things. There's a pile, uh, maybe about this high, on the side of my desk of outlines of things that have to be finished, and uh, and things that have to be changed. I wrote a a screenplay back in 2002 called In the Shadow of a Saint. And about a week ago, I was looking at it and I realized you should not be a screenplay. You should be a novel. Because there are things you can't say in a screenplay because a director with his ego yes. or her ego yes. has to say, wait a minute, this is what the character's thinking. You can't go what's inside the head. Isn't a screenplay basically just dialogue? It's basically dialogue. And the and director saying, and yeah. the actors as he picks up the fork, he says, you know, something yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So 
it's going to be made into a screenplay now. And I can say all the extra stuff I want to put in it. And uh, You mean it's going to be, the screenplay is going to be made into made a into novel? Made into a novel. And Good I think it you. would make a wonderful novel about a husband who's always trying to second guess his wife. And it's not like, it's sort of like the road runner, <laughs> you know, beep, 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 <laughs> you know. And they, even though she keeps very quiet, uh, she realizes what she's married to. And he doesn't, re he has like, no clue. So I think it, it, it could be a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, book. Sure, and, story. Yes, and I hope to start it. Uh, I would think in about a week, I start doing the conversion, which would add another, at least another 100 pages to it. So I think it's very unusual, or maybe it's not, that you think in terms of writing novels, plays, and poetry. And um, there are different mindsets, I would imagine. They are. So which ones do you like? Which ones well, do you like? Well, the thing best? is, since living out here on the end of uh, Long Island, I've been sticking mostly to my poetry. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because I know if I give somebody one of my plays, I'm going to have to go back into the city to be dealing with that or back to London where you know I, I worked also dealing with it and that doesn't help the transition that's been nice coming out here and being very free in fact I started a whole new uh, collection of poems called the Hamptons extension and it's all poems that are about out here and they're small and funny and this and that but they're they were different from everything else. So I like the way the path my life is on right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but again, I do love to see my plays re redone, you know, and uh, come back out. Uh, and that, that could happen too. It's just a question of when you're doing them, you really have to be involved yes. in a different way. When I'm writing uh, a poem, I am in my own my own room, you know, and, and no one's Your own space. There. The my own space. The zone. The zone, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so that's the thing. But uh, yes, my plays, it's sad that some of them I should be, uh, you know, telling people to do, you know, sending them places. I belong to the Dramatist Guild. You know, they're always sending me, why don't you send plays to this thing, this, you know, they give you all this information. And I just feel uh, at this point, is the plays the, my most important thing or is it the, or is it the poetry, or just the fact that you're still in the in the process of creating? Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of things you want to write, and a lot of things many writers don't understand that they're not capable of actually writing those things. So you put them, you know, on the side of your desk, and you think when you've got the the smarts to do it, you can do it. Yeah, well, I think in terms of this pile that you have on the side of your desk, which would make me crazy, <laughs> okay, because I'd want to finish them all. I'm a finisher. I should be more of a doer than a finisher, but, um, you know, authors really have to decide what it is they want. What is it that you want out of writing? Because writing can be very frustrating. Uh, finishing something and then not having it go anywhere can be very frustrating. So you really have to, at some point in your writing career, decide what is it about this creative process, this writing process, that I want out of life. Sharing. The thing is, I send a lot of my poems out. Every Halloween, I send a poem out, and Peter, yes, my I partner, <laughs> yes, and, uh, and Peter does all the artwork. It's my first day of spring, the poem goes out, the, uh, the Christmas poems. Mm -hmm. And there are other little poems that go out during the, the course of the mm -hmm. year. And that is the most exciting thing because it's very intimate. And when people write back and say what they think of the poem, good, bad, or indifferent, I cut and paste that into a whole list, and they get put away with the poem. And, and, and like where sometimes the list could be 25 pages long of just critiques, and then sometimes there, there may be two pages of critiques, but, eh, you know. And, but it's wonderful to be able to share. And there are people, my dentist, my doctor, the um, just people that I sort of just pass in uh, pass by in life and get to talk about writing, and I and I say what's your email address, and they go on the list, and it costs nothing to email a poem no, to 250 people, I and know. Uh, and and it's uh, so the, I'm fulfilled in that way. 
you know. Yeah, I'm uh, glad you said sharing because that's how I feel about my writing. When I, I, I never really think of myself as a writer. I think of myself as a storyteller. Yes. And I love to tell stories. I love to make up things. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, well, it is. It's uh, there are, uh, uh, for instance, in this book, in Fifty Poems About Spring, every one of those poems are different. But I don't mean different in like talking about this or that, they're different looks at, at what spring is and mm -hmm. what it is internally, externally, the, you know. Uh, there's one poem about a Russian woman working in a job saying, when do I get rid of this coat? you know, So you have all these, uh, these different visions of how this, this season is or anything else that you're writing about. And I find that when I write the, the, the poems, and whatever sparks the image of the poem, my head gets very big, and I'm very happy because then I'm then very excited to send it out, and and wait to see how my family and my friends uh, react to it. And uh, and right now in life, that and mowing are the, <laughs> about the things that I enjoy. Well, I I can relate to that. I love to work in my garden, and I I work a lot of things through in my head when I'm digging yes. in the dirt, as yes. I call it. Yes, that's it. You're, yeah. you're doing it and you're thinking about how how the character is going to work, especially if you're doing a, a, a novel, not as much a novel, say a, a play, and especially on a play where you have to think you're in front of, you know, you're on a stage, you have X amount of minutes to say what you have to do, you have to think of the body language, you have to think of all these things, and so you're walking like this, and I suppose people see me walking down the street and say, does he have something wrong with his arm because he's going like this because the person... <laughs> Because the character is doing that, or, or walking with a limp, or turning his head, you know, and you're playing like that. A poem is more exacting, and it could be very short, and it could be very long. But it's a, it's a, you know, and it's, 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 it's a less expensive way to, to write, you know, mm -hmm. you because everything else costs a lot of money. You know, first you have to get the play, then you have to get an agent. Now I had an agent in New York, then I went to London. And then I had and my agent in New York, who was Flora Roberts, you know, she handled Sondheim and everybody else. She was wonderful. She had done my first contract in London, and then she got sick and she died. Uh. And so then I got a London agent who was uh, maybe not the best agent in the world. And then, but in London, I found that most people had uh, uh, like lawyers as their agents. So then I did that. But when I came back to New York, I just thought, oh no, not yet. You know, I'm moving to Long Island. Mm. Let me not think about somebody calling me up and saying, I want this done. You know, just enjoy life for a few years and then go back to the group. Well, I, I think authors, uh, they, they go through an evolution of, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I want to write this, and then you get involved in it, and you realize that it's really too involved or it's not, it's not fulfilling you, and then you move on to something else. But I think um, the... In what what would be of interest to the people who watch this show is how you published. Well, the thing is, I, I, as I said, um, when I had, I was Peter was painting Peter Best and my my partner who has a show now going on in the in the nor on the the North Shore, and uh, someone from the Quag Library where they were going to show some of his paintings had come to the house to see the paintings. He had, this person said to me, uh, Peter says that you are a poet. I said, yes. She said, why, won't, why don't you come to the Quag Library and read some poems? I said, what? And she said, yes, and you can sell your books. And I said, what books? So the next day, I went there with seven Christmas poems. And I said, before you tell somebody to come here and talk in front of everybody, um, I think it would be advantageous to see what they actually they do. Mm -hmm. And she read the seven poems and she cried. She said, because this, uh, I never seen Christmas written about in this, this manner. And then she came back to the thing about, and you can sell your books. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, so I came home and Peter said, what did they think? And I said, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so there was Little Christmas, which I had published in, in London. And Peter did the artwork for that and everything else. But it needed a New York look. And so he did a whole new cover and everything. And then he did, you know, the cover and everything for, for the 50 poems about Christmas. And I called up my printer, who never published, never printed a book. And I said, 
Well, you print the big, every time I have to send a screenplay or a stage play out, you print those up. I said, this is going to be smaller and everything. And so we went to talk to him and, and uh, how we could all work on letting this get done properly. It was a matter of creating a file. Creating. So they were very happy to do it, the testing and everything. Plus, he keeps copies of all of it on his machines. So when I need new copies. Not only that, but the best thing about this is there's no middleman. There is no you middleman. You have complete control over That's this. That's it. And please share this very exciting uh, success story you had with the Christmas poems. Well, that, that, that's wonderful. And uh, in mid-November, I got a call from the Archdiocese of New York. And they said, you're the, you know, the author of uh, 50 Poems About Christmas. I said, yes, I am. And they said, uh, we would like to buy some books for, to give out our gala. We give them a book every year at the gala at the Waldorf. And I said, well, how many would you like to buy? I thought, 10 books. <laughs> she said, 1,000 oh books. Oh, my God. <laughs> I said, 1,000 books? I said, you really want to buy 1,000 books? They said, yes. So I, and I said, well, when would you need them? They said, in two days. Now, here's the luck. When you get, you have a printer, your own printer, you always make sure the minute he delivers what you got, you call up and give them your American Express number. So they're paid and their accountants love you. And I called up, I said, I need a thousand copies of the book and I need them in two days. I said, can that be done? He said, for you, it's done. And in two days, they delivered them to the arts diocese. Wow. And then Peter and I went to the, we were invited then to the gala and, and everybody came over to want me to sign their book because in their gold book that everybody had on their table, there was pictures of my book. And it said, thank you, Vito Gentile, for the book. And uh, so all through dinner, there were people coming over to talk about the book and everything else. And at one point, the cardinal came over and punched me in the back and said, this is my party, not yours. Everybody's talking to you, not me. And we laughed and laughed and laughed. Did oh, you get to read some of the poems? No, no. Uh, if, but when we came out of the hotel, the street was packed with these women holding the book. Oh, wow. And they all wanted to, to have them sign. And they followed me all the way down Park oh, Avenue so to Grand funny. Central. I'm signing books. Now, everybody's on the street uh, standing back. What, what is this mob? And Peter's <laughs> going around snapping pictures. And I, at one point, bent over and I said, Peter, I feel more like a politician than a poet. <laughs> but it was so wonderful. And taking the train ride home, I thought my head couldn't even sit in the cr train car. It was the most wonderful day I had ever experienced something like that. It was just so, so beyond me. I had put some poems in my pocket to, you know, to, in case somebody asked to read a poem. And, uh, and on the train going into the city that morning, I, I was going over them. But there was a lady sitting next to me at the dinner who kept on asking me so many questions about the poems and how I created them. So I took my thing out and I said to her, here. Read them. <laughs> you can read all these poems. Some of them are not even in the book, but you can read those on your way home and you'll see how the way they might be different from what's in the book and everything else like that. So, but everybody was nice. Every, and, and it was so fulfilling to, to know that, uh, uh, that um, this happened. Uh, a friend of ours who lives out here, who's a sculptor, uh, called me up about hearing this. He said, you know, right now you're the most prolific writer on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> he said, who sells a thousand books in one hit? So it, it really, it made for a wonderful Christmas, a, uh, a wonderful ev everything. And I, and, I, and I treasure that day. Sure, that's, that, that, is, that is amazing. And now you're famous. Yeah. <laughs> and Vito has fame changed you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think it's fame uh, that I've, everybody says they want fame, but I think what, what we really want is accomplishment. Mm -hmm. To lay down in bed at night and say, okay, I, I'm doing everything the way I want to do it, and I'm enjoying doing it, and it seems that there are some people appreciating what I'm doing, and that's all you could ask for. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Now, you're retired from whatever well, the thing is, day job was. <laughs> well, well, that that's many years ago. Uh, for over forty years, I worked on Wall Street freelancing, mm -hmm. and 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 there, as I think I mentioned, I wrote a book called The Fundamentals of Wall Street yeah. and taught. And uh, it was strange because I couldn't spell and everything, so they hired me a sec uh, a, some a, um, 
a I secretary to, to take, take uh, dictation and an editor to, to do the book. So yeah, that that, that's great. Yeah, but now, now, of course, there's a computer program where you yeah. just speak into it. And yeah, and this was the days before there were computers. And the things that I wrote in the book were all, all passe because everything was pre-computer. Oh, there, sure. there was a key punch operator group, but they were involved in the day-to-day -day stuff that you were doing. But, uh, you know, again, as a writer, you have to really stay, not be frightened of trying anything. Mm -hmm. You know, working in television, which is very strange because you have 17 different lines of who, who's, who's going to read it and how they're going to see it. <clears throat> and, uh, and writing for the stage and, the, and writing for the screen. We can do it all. It's just not to get nervous and not to get bullied. <clears throat> oh, well, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, you I mean, have to have self-confidence. Yeah. But you want to read some of your poems. And I would like to hear some of your poems about spring because I'm beginning to believe we're never going to get it this year. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. I just look, okay. Waiting for warmth, twilight, and crisscross shadows to cross the sun, for songs, new and euphoric echoing ballads, transistor sonnets and, and mellowing tones, all announcing a moon-swept night, for breezes to ripple to the studs on an open shirt, to an awkward smile causing cassage 